do. Oh, there we go. Thank you. No I'm a bit new to this. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's all right. Let's go ahead and start with Refuge and Bodhicitta. Sange chudam sugi chunam lai janchu badu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam ki rola penchia sange drupa sho sange chudam sugi chunam lai janchu badu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam ki Rola penchia sange drupa sho sange chudon sogi chunam la janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi rola penchia sange drupa sho and just letting the motivation connect and stabilize. Okay. All right. So we're continuing with Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life, which, uh, you know, I think is much beloved. And if you don't know it yet, you shall love it, I think. Um, but it's uh, it's something that we talked about just kind of in an overview way last time. We were just talking about main themes and some of the uh, pop out verses. And uh, now today we're going to start from the beginning, but not every single verse, obviously, because we don't have the time. So we'll do mainly chapters one and two today. And, uh, and we might sort of pop into different sections as well, just seeing as we go. And um, I think that uh, today we'll do maybe two meditations, two shorties. Um, if you're in the mood for meditation, um, it seems like we're sort of in a meditation mo mood, this group looks like. Nods, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. So we'll do two shorty meditations as well to break it up. And um, I think it'll be quite nice. So starting at the top. Just so we don't lose anybody, we got relative bodhicitta, remember? The mind of enlightenment or the spirit of enlightenment or the heart of enlightenment, depending on your translator. This being the main Mahayana motivation, the altruistic mind that seeks enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. So the point of the whole text is to develop bodhicitta. Yeah, what's the point to guide to a bodhisattva's way of life? To develop bodhicitta and eventually become a Buddha, right? Um, then we have ultimate bodhicitta, which is the same exact thing in the mind of someone who has realized emptiness of inherent existence directly or perceptually. All right, relative bodhicitta, ultimate bodhicitta. Yeah, we, we talked about that last time. And then of relative bodhicitta, we just touched briefly on there being another subdivision, aspiring and engaging. And the difference of these two bodhicittas is like the desire to go and actually going. So here we'll get into the verses. <clears throat> so in chapter one, the benefits of the mind of enlightenment, it's kind of like the advertising chapter. Like, why is it a good idea to have this way of thinking? What's in it for you? What's in it for sentient beings? What's in it for the greater good? And so jumping to verse 15, Shanti Deva says, in brief, you should understand the mind of enlightenment to be of two types, the mind that wishes enlightenment and the mind that engages enlightenment. As understood by the instances of desiring to go and going, so the wise should understand respectively the distinction between these two. <clears throat> and then, although, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for one who has perfectly adopted this mind, with the thought never to turn away for the sake of totally liberating the infinite realms of sentient beings, from that time onward, even while asleep or lacking conscientiousness, a force of merit equal to the sky will continuously ensue. So in verse 18, we have a directive to take bodhisattva vows. For one who has perfectly adopted this mind, what does it mean to perfectly adopt this mind? To promise to do so, to promise to do so. And then what's the benefit of that? From this time onwards, 
even while asleep or vaguing out, right, lacking conscientiousness, the force of merit equal to the sky will continuously ensue. And this is true of all vows and why they are so important and powerful for progress. So we'll just talk a little bit about that. If you want bodhis, if you want bodhicitta, right? You truly want bodhicitta to take root in your heart. You want this mind that seeks enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. We already know wanting that is not enough. We know that what we're going to actually need is some sort of proactive measure to transform the mind. And habituation works, you know, remembering again and again, you know, every time you do a mistake, every time you say the wrong thing, you're reminded, oh, right, right, right. That's not my path, you know, and you adjust and correct and all of these things. But what's an efficient way? We want an efficient way to develop merit and momentum developing this mind very strongly. And so when you make a vow, it's intentionally doing the thing every second of every day ever after in an active way as opposed to passively trying to be a good person when the situation arises but if you're home by yourself and there's no one around or if there's no one difficult in your life there's not like the opportunity to engage with these ideas when you've made the vow it's like ticking along in the back of your mind ever after and I think if we think of our own experiences in life, there is power in promises. There's power in promises. Do you feel it, right? Like a marriage vow or a commitment to rescue an animal or, you know, some sort of even tiny decisions like, yes, I'll meet you for coffee as opposed to just randomly meeting for coffee. There's something that happens when you make a commitment. And when you make a big commitment like the Bodhisattva vow, you're engaging with the unbroken oral tradition from the time of the Buddha. The Bodhisattva vows were given during the Buddha's lifetime. They're expressed in a number of sutras. Um, the easiest to come across is the Brahma Net Sutra. It talks about the Bodhisattva vows in a lot of detail, and that's where the Chinese Pure Land tradition derives theirs from. They're all over the place. The Buddha gave the Bodhisattva vows. And connecting to the unbroken oral tradition is like carrying a type of thread or a type of channel to the Buddha himself, which means you're also held and protected and supported by this lineage. You're also just reminded that you're not the first person to try and do this really heroic, perhaps, <laughs> I don't know, overkill kind of way of kindness. Um, you know, we're not the first ones who've tried this, and that should be a great sort of I guess, nourishment or reassurance to us. But it's more than that. There's something palpable. And from the, you know, depending on what tenant school you speak from, in the sutra um, tenant school or the mind only tenant school, sometimes they talk about vows as having subtle form, subtle form, not form that you could touch, but very subtle form. And they talk about your vows as having like a precept body that holds you in a certain way. And I think when we're very in our intuition or in our energetic sensitivity or really, you know, tuning into the great beyond, we can feel a difference when someone has taken a big vow, like a lifetime vow or a lifetime's vow. Like the difference between, you know, a beautiful couple that's been together for years, living together, happy, harmonious, and now they've decided, they've committed to each other. There's some sort of energetic shift whether it's a formalized ceremony or something they did privately amongst themselves, there's a shift somehow, and it's hard to describe. If you have friends that have taken ordination, you might feel there's a shift more than just the look of them being different. There's something, something has shifted and they're carrying something different that protects them and also invites better things. So this is something that, you know, you can kind of leave in the realm of ambiguity and, you know, maybe that's a bit too woo-woo and I don't know about that. But I think we all believe, even in a very secular way, that promises are important and that it's significant to decide. So the Bodhisattva vow is active, whereas when you're being a nice person in your daily life, it's a little bit more passive. 
so the karma you create is different when you've chosen to decisively live in this way as opposed to incidentally when you remember and so the bodhisattva vow once you've taken it even when you're asleep even when you're vague even when you do the wrong thing it's ticking along in the background there helping you gather merit this mental momentum that leads to fundamental shifts and the way the bodhisattva vow is described is like a golden vase something incredibly uh, valuable and very delicate easy to dent right gold is a soft metal very easy to dent and very easy to repair so it's precious <laughs> it's easy to dent it's easy to repair and vows in buddhism are slightly different than maybe the way you think about vows in the ordinary world. The assumption is you're probably not going to be perfect or you wouldn't need the vow to begin with. Yeah. You're, so what is the way to hold a vow purely is to immediately address any micro transgressions and restore and revive the vow. So to actually break the vow at the root such that you don't have it anymore you have to really mean it right you have to really mean it and those of you that have highest yoga tantra you read this in succession guru yoga every day what does it take to lose bodhisattva vows first not seeing this transgression as a fault not giving up the wish to engage in them doing this negativity with delight and satisfaction and having no shame or consideration so you need all four of those factors to actually break a bodhisattva vow from the root, except for holding wrong views and giving up bodhicitta. So holding wrong views and giving, giving up bodhicitta are so serious that you don't even need those four branches to break them. But when you look at that, you mean to break it on purpose. It's not a slip of mindfulness. It's not like a clumsy moment. You very intentionally are harmful and happy about it. So that actually takes quite a lot, yes? If you've decided, I want to work for the welfare of all sentient beings, I want to become a Buddha for the welfare of all sentient beings, and then for some reason, some relationship in your life has got you all boiling with resentment, and you decide, I'm going to work for the welfare of all sentient beings except for you, <laughs> right? And you mean it. And you're happy and delighted about cutting one person out of your heart. That would break the vow, yes? But you have to really mean it. Yeah, not just a passing thought of, oh, that was an uncharitable thought, a just. You have to really mean it. Yeah. So, so really think of these bodhisattva vows as incredibly precious, very easy to transgress, very easy to mend. And the benefit of them is that it carries this momentum ever after the rest of your life. How does that whole premise sit with you guys? Does that have like the ring of truth or do you find some resistance or how does that all sit? The whole idea that vows, once you take them, carry so much more positive karma than just kind of incidentally try to be a nice person yeah and the, this idea that um vows have subtle form and that you develop this kind of precept body this is you know take it or leave it you know grain of salt but but do think about your own life and your own experiences of promises and kind of the shifts that happen energetically or in your heart or, you know, just kind of think about it a little bit experientially and see if there's something in there that you can kind of touch with some experience. Yeah, a shift between passive and active. So to take the Bodhisattva vows, you need to take them in the first time from someone who already has them because we want to connect to the benefit and blessings of that unbroken oral tradition um, but then after that you can retake them and restore them by yourself you know just with one verse and it's a very easy verse to find and if you google bodhisattva vows fpmt pdf it will show up magically and you can download it easy peasy um, and the verse is there in the back of the book to restore but to take it the first time you do need a teacher um, relationship because the person you take the vows from it carries a commitment to that individual 
So if you want the Bodhisattva vows, but you don't know about the person giving it, wait until you know them. Do your vetting, suss them out, make sure you feel they are a reliable person to be the mouthpiece of the Buddha for me. Often bodhisattva vows are given in the context of a tantric empowerment, in which case the commitment is hugely more. But sometimes His Holiness the Dalai Lama will give the bodhisattva vows just on their own in isolation, not necessarily as part of a, a tantric empowerment. And some of the geshis at the various centers will do the same, particularly if you request it. So if that's something you're interested in, um, you know, make it happen, create the cause by doing those requests at your local Dharma center. Okay, questions about bodhisattva vows. And those of you that already have bodhisattva vows, are there any that have been niggling you that you wanted to ask about? Nah, all right, <laughs> cool. All right, so for one who has perfectly adopted this mind with the thought never to turn away for the sake of totally liberating the infinite realms of sentient beings, from that time onwards, even while asleep or lacking conscientiousness, the force of merit equal to the sky will continuously ensue. Okay. So when we're developing bodhicitta, there's actions and antidotes and different ways of really getting it to change our heart fundamentally such that it becomes uncontrived and that we become a bodhisattva. And taking and maintaining the bodhisattva vows is one of the strongest ways. There are 18 root vows and 46 secondary vows, but they all boil down to refraining from negative actions, those that are destructive, engaging in positive actions, those that are constructive, and actively seeking to benefit sentient beings. So they all boil down to these three. And then we continue on, like what are other ways to develop bodhicitta, you know, sideways or introductory ways or reinforcing ways. And again and again, we come back to this framework of hearing, contemplating, and meditation. So hearing, listening to oral teachings, particularly again and again and again, is hugely beneficial. Some of us have heard the teaching on this particular text, you know, 10, 20, 30 times already in our lifetime, and it's not going to be enough until it takes hold. And I think that we all know there is a difference between a text that you've had an oral transmission of and a text that you're kind of going in cold. Um, Maybe you read the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, you know, 20 years ago or something, but it never had teachings on it. And you thought, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's confusing. And you liked it. And then you had oral teachings from some teacher. And then it like was open to you. Then it became like this present living thing. You know, you had this kind of deep relationship with the text after having had the oral transmission. Something shifts with that oral transmission. And there's something, you know, really interesting and esoteric and kind of magical about that. But then there's something also just very human about having an engagement with a human being talking through ideas together. So, you know, one of the, the most common advices I give to people who are struggling to get momentum in their practice is keep showing up. Just keep showing up to live things live dharma things just again and again keep showing up I, I remember during the pandemic uh lockdown period and i was stranded in montana i thought well where's the closest dharma center that's offering live online teachings and metripa college was having the most uh, you know sort of time zone friendly ones with young z rinpoche and he was doing like an introduction to Buddhism. Um, and, you know, I've been a nun for more than 20 years. Like I teach introduction to Buddhism all the time. But I thought, I'm going to go to introduction to Buddhism. <laughs> this will be great. Fun the first time. Right. And it was so lovely, right, to just go through those things that I'd heard so many times, that I'd taught so many times. But just to keep showing up to these ideas that I love wakes them up. You know, so having this mentality that just keeps showing up to the Dharma classes. 
And knowing that, you know, it's hard to get things organized and the logistics can be frustrating, but the live encounter can never be overestimated, I think. And alone in your room with some books, it gets a little poignant. Yeah, it gets a little poignant. So if you're ever feeling that kind of stagnation in your practice, you know, we kind of incline and then plateau and then incline and then plateau. If you're in the plateau, perhaps even a dip, <laughs> show up to some classes. It might not even matter the topic. It might not even matter the topic. Just keep showing up. Would you guys agree? Some of you are old Dharma students from, from way back. Um, what's kind of kept you going? in the dry spells, the dark nights of the soul, <laughs> the existentials. I think I'm actually on one of those plateau levels at the moment, which is why I sort of, sort of tried to, yeah, basically sort of come along with this. Yeah. To be <laughs> like, well, just, let's just show up to this. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And and the thing that, you know, like Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo always says is start again, just start again. Even if you've started again a million times, just, you know, you, you lose the thread or you have a gap or you sort of, you know, had some lost years, you had some attachment thing or you had some grief thing or you had a health thing. And for whatever reason, your practice kind of dipped, even though you love it. You know, it, the maturity that says don't throw the baby out with the bathwater just because you lost momentum, just start again. You know, it's it's a deep maturity that can do that. Um, and it also is a, a kinder way of looking at your own transformation because you're not expecting to have finished anything or accomplished anything or to be anything other than you are. You know, it's it's a kinder framing. So just, you know, keep having that beginner's mind, even if you've been a beginner for many, many, many lifetimes, because we all have. Yeah. Oh, um, see, there was a, in the chat, I've had a massive gap from in-person teachings. And so what you say really resonates. It feels good to be back. Yeah. Yeah. Same. And thank goodness for technology, because a lot of people are quite rural or, you know, not connected to Dharma Center. So at least we can do live things this way. Um, so hearing is huge, you know, and never underestimate the positive karma or the merit that comes from just hearing in an engaged way. And then there's contemplating. And this step, sometimes we skip. Yeah, we go from class to meditation and we sometimes miss the step of contemplation. And this is really a deep personal reflection on the topic. You know, you're mulling it over. You're mulling it over with your own logic and your own life experience and so with bodhicitta, you know, these are words we've heard. We These are ideas we've studied. But, you know, you're walking the dog. Have a think about bodhicitta. Right? You're cleaning the kitchen floor. Have a think about bodhicitta. You're going for a hike in the woods. You know, how do I have more bodhicitta in my life? What stands in opposition to it? What supports it? What exactly is it? What are my, like, palpable experiences of it so far in my life? You just ask yourself questions about it in your own voice to yourself as your own internal dialogue. It doesn't have to be at all structured. It doesn't have to be sitting down. But this wisdom that comes from contemplation is huge because it's the bridge between what you hear in class and what you can do on your cushion. So sometimes if we jump to the cushion, we can kind of feel a bit awkward, like what exactly am I supposed to be doing here? And then we'll revert back to something we know how to do, you know, maybe some like mindfulness on the breath or maybe some, you know, set of prayers that we're used to, which is beautiful and good. But if you're wanting to enrich a certain section of your practice and you're not sure how, just go back to the step of contemplation, you know, and really engage with it. And this is also where you get meaty questions to bring up in class um, because you've really had a thought, a think about it, like, okay. I'm on board, bodhicitta is a good idea, and yet, and, you know, and whatever your and yet gap is becomes clearer and more concise and easier to articulate, which means it's easier to get good answers. So, you know, don't underestimate this power of contemplation. It's a powerful tool. It's where debate also lives. It's where discussion also lives. So contemplation, while it's personal, it doesn't have to be just by yourself. 
So talking through things with your Dharma friends, um, really, really meaningful. And then we have meditation methods using logic and experience. Okay, so this is the one that we did last week. We did equalizing and exchanging self for others, landing on Tonglen. And this is kind of the logic catalyst for developing bodhicitta. So we looked at how all sentient beings are equal in wanting happiness, not wanting suffering, in having Buddha nature, and having innate ignorance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we looked at the logic of numbers, that we are one, others are many. So prioritizing one is an excessive focus. The ratio is off. And then we think of the disadvantages of self-cherishing, the advantages of cherishing others, and decide to exchange cherishing self to, for cherishing others in a really deep, decisive way. And then we practice living that out in real time with the practice of Tonglen. So last time, did you have any questions about that particular practice or interesting things that came up? Yeah, uh, Leonardo? Hi. Hey. Uh, I was just wondering about uh, the matter of uh, contemplating. Uh, it's really like... I'm... gift when we have to talk to ourselves and then um, sometimes it's not like it's not all good because for example for me personally I uh, have this kind of problem I don't know because my mind is so discursive and then sometimes like I start dwelling in my own thoughts and then that leads me to some I don't know ugly places <laughs> And then, like, I've learned through the practices and all to, like, uh, stop, you know, like, th there are points when we have to stop thinking, really, because it can lead us to, I don't know, dark places, you know. But I, I for me, I, I think it's a gift because I kind of, uh, I, I experience, like, good thinking and um, most of the times it leads me to good places but I have to be watchful you know because sometimes it doesn't go very well that, that's the yeah only yeah and you know when you start to spin out you know and I think that when you're doing the wisdom of contemplation it helps to have a container if you're in a little bit of a prone to darkness day, you know, if you're getting a bit morose, you're getting a bit melancholy, you're getting a bit whatever is your particular trend, a container is helpful. And by container, I mean like a prayer that you already love, like the foundation of all good qualities or some of the verses from this text or the three principal aspects of the path or whatever it is, some short prayer, you know, eight verses of thought transformation, but a short series of verses to kind of uh, be the catalyst for your contemplation. So you read one verse, and then it's as if you're having a conversation with it. You're saying, okay, well, what about that line? What does that mean? What did the teacher say about that one? What did the commentary say about this one? And it becomes a conversation that's a bit contained because you have this structure to move within. So particularly on days when you feel like if I start an analysis, it may not go well because I'm in one of those moods, give yourself a chance by giving a container like a series of verses in a prayer that can really help. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the question. So, so with equalizing and exchanging, you know, this, this one, it only works if you're very real with yourself. You know, if you just kind of like are going through it, like checking off boxes, it doesn't have the same depth. And I mean, that's true of everything. But when you're thinking, what are the disadvantages of self-cherishing, for example, don't just think there are many, <laughs> you know, and leave it at that, right? Like think specifically. So for me, when I have self-cherishing, very up and driving, what do I do that hurts myself and others? See your memories, for examples. You know, like really make it real. And if you can't think of anything right off the bat, you can think, all right, well, globally, what's wrong right now? Could I identify the main source of all the troubles in the world being self-cherishing? Yeah. 
<laughs> right? And then it elaborates into all sorts of unfortunate political decisions. But like the root of the root, right, is self-cherishing. Why don't we share, right? Like, why is there war? Why is someone like, I want that land? And the other people are like, no, you can't have it. Mah. You know, like it's self-cherishing. And we, we think it's this very complicated political situation. But, you know, we're like children who can't share. And why can't we share? Because self-cherishing says it will cost me to share. I need this protection of whatever it is. And it's a lie, but it feels real because of self-grasping. So we don't see how the self exists. And so then we try to protect this false self and again and again, make decisions that hurt ourselves and others. And then because we're hurting, we make even worse decisions, right? It's as simple as that. And we already know that, but if you're sort of, you know, looking for examples in your life of self-cherishing and if they're not coming quickly, look globally, then look at your, you know, state or your town, your neighborhood, your family, yourself, <laughs> you know, just gradually go like that or start with yourself and expand out. But part of not just leaving it on yourself is helping you understand that this is part of the human condition and that you're not like a particular rat bag. Like you're not the only jerk in the town, right? Because some people can have the tendency once you do self-reflection to go, oh, it's worse than I thought. Don't, you know, don't over-identify. Be like, oh, this is how we are. This is how we are. Not this is how I am or how you are. This is how we are. Then it feels like this collaborative thing of any insight you gain into piercing through it has some sort of ripple effect. Do you know what I mean? And then you think of the advantages of cherishing others and it can feel too sugary sweet and too sort of self-aggrandizing and too like patting yourself on the back. Oh, how wonderful I am when I'm in a good mood. You know, don't make it, you, you know, saccharine or something. Like really think genuinely when you are in a good space, the benefit you have to others is more. You know, they, when they get the best of you, that has a ripple effect too. And your friends and family, you know, when they think about what they can rely on you for, those are some beautiful traits that are intermittently present, right? They, they are traits that you have, but they're not consistent because none of us are consistent. And so in thinking of the benefits of cherishing others, you're thinking of what you already do well and that you would like to do it more often, more consistently. Yeah. And when you're thinking of, you know, when a neighborhood is functioning well, when a country is functioning well, when the world is functioning well, what are the characteristics? It's not being blinkered, you know, and blind, you know, sort of like in this tunnel vision. It's when there's an expanded focus of genuinely considering the needs of others. And even to feel that counterintuitive tug of, Thinking of others when you're in a bad mood feels like the last thing you want to do. But when you do it, the relief is incredible. It just is such a moment of tension and resistance in that like segue, right? In that little moment of truth between, am I going to dive into my melancholy or am I going to pop out of it and think of others? It's really uncomfortable. Yeah. And your ego is under threat. But when you do it, the relief is incredible. So cherishing others benefits you. Cherishing others benefits others. Cherishing yourself really is no good to anyone at any time, including yourself, except for the briefest moment of some sort of symptoms relief of your immediate discomfort. Yeah, but it usually has very little staying power choices made under the influence of self-cherishing, if you're thinking about them, you're never really as satisfied as you think you're going to be. You're like, oh, today's a me day. It's going to be all about me today. And then you do all your me choices. And then you're kind of like, oh, hum, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, use your memories, use them well, and use them in these meditations and use the scaffolding to kind of work through the different sections. So if you are looking at this process of equalizing and exchanging, do you have any questions or any comments about it before we shift to another?
Does it feel like you could you could do it on your own? Yeah, Joe, go ahead. Um, the the logic of the numbers, I I kind of understand the logic conceptually, but is there other ways of uh, kind of building up, reinforcing it? Because it's just, I'm not sure I would lay down my life at the moment for anybody. Yeah, no, I, know not, I know I'm not being asked for that, but. No, no, you're being real. And that is uh, key. <laughs> I mean, I, I often think of the logic of numbers in terms of just like first start with the wise selfishness and then expand to more and more genuine and deep forms of altruism. So the wise selfishness, I, I often think of like cooking, because if I'm cooking just for myself, like I'll make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you know, like I can't be bothered, you know, it's too much work. But if I have a bunch of friends coming over, I'm going to make a nice meal with like healthy food that's fresh, lots of courses, bring out like actual plates. I won't just like eat it on the tiny plate, like standing in the kitchen. I might actually sit down and eat properly. You know, I might make some beautiful chai. And because people are coming over, I'm going to all this effort for them because I want them to be happy. But I wind up having a good meal that I wouldn't have had just thinking of myself. You know, so it's like how expanded focus benefits you. Or, you know, I think about something like you're having a a little niggly thing, like you're hiking and you've got a rock in your shoe. If you're by yourself, you might get really frustrated at the rock in your shoe and be like, Hrumph, you know, and like sit down and get your boots off and shake it out and then put your boot back on. But if you're with a bunch of friends, you just kind of like, casually take off your shoe dump it out put it on keep talking all the while enjoying one another like it shrinks to its correct proportion because you're thinking of more than just you and your own little things so it's not like you stop caring for yourself it's that the care you give yourself is in the correct proportion do you see what i mean and then it actually is better you feel much better because of that expanded focus so the logic of numbers is, is an interesting one to play with, either playing with it when you think of others, how you benefit, or how when you're having a difficulty, it's much easier with a widened focus. Either way, I think that can really help. So help. That, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, do, does, do, does anyone else have thoughts, questions? Yeah. Isla? So I'm not quite sure how to phrase it and how to context it, but... It's so when you get when you get kind of real and you contemplate and you think about these things, there there becomes this disconnect where there's this intellectual idea of okay, right, I this is good and this is not good, this is beneficial, this is harmful, this is poisonous to do, don't do it, etc. And then there's comes this instinctive reaction. It's almost like a war between parts of yourself. And because the feeling and the habit is so strong and I can kind of see that in relation to attachment, whether it's like, you know, attachment to oh, me and I need this. And, but then below that is this like this black hole that's like empty. And that I can see that that's why it then goes, oh yeah, but if you have this, then that or the black, there won't be this hole anymore. Even though I know intellectually, there's not even a hole in the first place. It's not even a thing, but it feels like that. So then you're stuck with this pain where you then don't know how to you're not at the point where you can stabilize in your own head and, and create joy there. But yeah. you know that out there is wrong, but you have this such strong feeling of, yeah, but that that's the thing. And you're going, yeah, but it's not. It's really not. Just go away. <laughs> but first, but first. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, yeah. how do you, in relation to anything, whether it be exchange yourself with others, whether it be attachment, whether it, it, I think it fits in with all of it, this, this split. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the thing, you know, the, the, the lies that self-cherishing has been telling us, they've been telling us forever, you know, and we have certain strategies to kind of like navigate around the discomforts of our life that have a certain amount of benefit. And we don't want to let go of them because it's all that we know, you know, so to exchange it for something bigger or deeper, it's scary because it feels like you're relinquishing those very few crumbs of security you have. And, and that feeling of like the big hole, sometimes like a big hole in your heart or a big hole in your stomach. And it's just like, 
I need to be full for, for first before I can give. I need to be full. How do I get full? You know, and I, yes, I want to benefit others, but I just feel this big gaping need or something. And that sort of palpable experience can be really interesting to work with because if you imagine, like, imagine there is a big hole at your heart, but it's manufactured by self-cherishing and cherishing others is like stretching the hole so open that you're just openness so rather than trying to fill the hole you're stretching it out until it's a big expanse and there's nothing there to fill now because you're feeling like wholeness you know like a w-h-o-l-e <laughs> you know you're in that big expanse so so it's interesting to kind of play with what's a different way of approaching that like heaviness of heart or that kind of like uh uh sort of tension that can happen so rather than trying to fill it because that actually will sh make it feel like a bottomless pit you know before you start to address it you're like oh that's a little uncomfortable and then you start to like use strategies of attachment and then the chasm opens like a giant ravine you know, and then how will it ever be filled? And then just, you know, depression and sadness and all this like angst. But instead, if you feel I'm taking the hole and I'm stretching it so open, it doesn't have any sides anymore. I'm, I'm thinking of more and more and more and more and more people. And this is kind of what we do with Tonglen is you think of what is going wrong with me right now? You know, physically, what's uncomfortable or painful mentally what is happening that's distressing logistically what's annoying and or even really frightening how about i decide that i want it and i give it to the self-cherishing attitude and actually i want everyone else's too everyone else having financial difficulty or relationship difficulty or a scary health diagnosis or discomfort of aging or instability i want it give it to me all the things i don't want i actually do want they came from the self-cherishing thought, give them back to the self-cherishing thought. It's almost like it's so much, it like bursts the hole into just expanse. And then you think all of the happiness I have, you know, it's like, don't take it from me. It's all I have. And you're hanging on to it. Like it's a blanket you've wrapped tight around you. But then if you imagine opening out the big giant blanket and holding everyone in it, it's so much warmer. You know, so so whatever kind of imagery gets you there, but the the nature of self cherishing is to kind of collapse and to go kind of cocooned or to kind of go into the chasm. And anything you can do that widens the gaze is going to be counterintuitive and momentarily uncomfortable for like a minute and a half, really not that long, and it can be an excruciating minute and a half. But it can be as simple as, how about I write a letter to my gran, you know, just thinking of one other person, you know, how about I brush the cat a little more, <laughs> you know, something so simple, but it's stretching you out of just the imploded focus of self-cherishing. The relief is incredible. So you just start to play with it that way. So don't worry about filling the hole, get rid of the hole altogether. I don't know if that helps, but it's something something to play with a little bit. You know, it's just a different strategy. Yeah, let's see. It looks like there's something in the chat. Let's see. And then there's the losing our uh, losing uh, ourselves and helping others and burnout and how to make sure that you're properly taking care of yourself. I think that that's the the piece of self cherishing um, and cherishing yourself in the correct way that we don't quite understand because there's positive self-cherishing and negative self-cherishing, right? So positive self-cherishing is really looking after yourself very well because you know that you're a, of benefit to others. It actually takes a lot of self-confidence to look after yourself. You know, my example of, oh, it's just me, I can't be bothered, I'm gonna make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That is a self-cherishing choice. If I really was in cherishing others, I would make the good healthy meal just for me because I need to be healthy to benefit others. I can get by with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but my benefit to others is much more limited than if I consistently eat well. 
So even noticing those little choices that seem to be hurting only you as symptoms of self-cherishing is a very useful exercise. And you think, okay, actually self-cherishing says stay up too late to finish the novel or to binge the Netflix or to zone into space or whatever you do at night that's unhealthy. Self-cherishing is what allows it. And you tell yourself it's only hurting me. But actually, it's hurting your your ability to benefit others. So you go to bed a good time, you sleep well, you know, you turn off the devices, you shift some habits. And that is all very good for you. But it's good for you in this holistic sense that means you can then expand and benefit others. So the way to prevent burnout is to rest before you burn out. We're so used to in our society not feeling like we're allowed to rest until we burn out, which means you have all this recovery time and picking yourself back up and brushing yourself off and getting back onto it. And it's so much more sustainable to rest consistently and periodically. And it's in the joyous effort section of the Lam Rim Chenmo is to rest when you're tired, right? Like what fuels joy? Resting regularly. And to rest before you're in that total exhaustion space, it's a new discipline. It's a whole new discipline because you're saying to yourself, I love what I'm doing so much. I need to have energy to do it. I better take a nap. Yeah. Or, you know, what, what I'm doing is got such meaning and has the potential for such benefit. I better make sure I slow down and eat properly. You know, so it's, it's a whole different vibe than people who get on a health kick and get really precious and fragile about it. You know, and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm gluten-free now. And you're like, well, it, yes, okay, whatever. See how it goes. But, you know, you can do that in a way that's like, in order to nourish myself, I'm going to try different diets to see if I can get my gut biome happy. Proceed. But people sometimes do it in this way that then becomes uh, very tight. Yeah. And they suck all the energy out of the room with their choices. And they're like, oh, 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 no, uh, no deadly nightshades can't have eggplant. And they, you know, and they go into a whole thing and their Ayurvedic medicine doctor says this and this and this, all of which might be fully valid, but the energy they're bringing to it is so precious. And me first, it's such a different thing than oh, I better go to a nutritionist or an Ayurvedic doctor or the Tibetan doctor or the acupuncturist or whatever and like get my diet sorted and figure out my allergies and food sensitivities. So I'm just organized so I can benefit others. It's got a lot, it doesn't have that yucky tightness. Yeah, and, and it doesn't get that weird specificity. You know, self-cherishing characteristics are sometimes we get so specific about our needs. Like the house has to be exactly this temperature. You know, the food has to be exactly this temperature, exactly these proportions with exactly these things. We get really, really tight about it. And, you know, people have to speak to me exactly in this way. You know, otherwise they're rude and I'm going to tell them off or I'm going to do my nonviolent communication in a passive aggressive way, <laughs> you know, and like, you know, we're all just trying to be good people, but sometimes our strategies can make us worse. You know, and we turn these medicines into poison. So the best self-care is having the self-awareness that understands your own pacing and makes choices based on the pace you know to be sustainable on an average day, not on your best day. Don't make plans based on yourself at your best. You know, so just kind of keeping those ideas about like burnout prevention and then burnout recovery, you're just reminding yourself that you love the work that you've chosen. You just overdid it. It wasn't the work's fault. It was the pacing. It was the, the way you approached it, but the work you do love, you know, cause you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but sometimes our enthusiasm can make us unskillful and we go in guns a blazing um, and burn ourselves out. So like that. Um, all right, I'm just looking in the chat at the question here. Um, the refuge class and vows and all the ways to create negative karma might send a person into a tailspin. Um, yep. <laughs> um, so how to deal with uh, negative karma. And um, let's see. 
<laughs> yeah, it looks like um, it's something that'll come up in the next chapter. Actually, is the the chapter on confession. So we'll we'll circle back to some of those karma ideas soon. But um, ask again if I don't get to it. All right. So we did this one, and uh, you know, in the text, it was this verse in chapter ten. However, many sick people there are suffering in body and mind in all directions. Due to my merit, may they obtain an ocean of happiness and joy. Just having this mental attitude that shifts. Yeah. And then this is the one that we'll do now. And I think most of us know this, but the sevenfold cause and effect, this is a gratitude catalyst as opposed to, uh, let's say, like a logic catalyst. Yeah. And this one is quite interesting. So I think we should do... Let's do a five minute uh, break just to stretch if you need to go to the loo and then we'll come back and do a meditation and do the rest of the chapters of the text that we planned for today. So just five minutes. Okay, so we don't have tons of time. So we'll just do this in the short way and, uh, and then we'll look a little bit at some of the other verses. So if you want to get yourself nice uh, meditation posture, straight back. And think in order to develop my mind, I need to meditate. May this meditation facilitate my development for the benefit of all. And so first you think sentient beings, though so vast, so many numbers, we couldn't possibly count them all. Sentient beings are so vast in number, and yet no new sentient beings are being created. We're just cycling through different rebirths, maybe even different planets, different realms. No new consciousnesses are being created. And take that idea together with the fact that time is beginningless, this means that although sentient beings are so vast in number, still, given beginningless time, we've met each other so many times, so many different relationships. Friend, enemy, stranger, predator, prey. And of all of the relationships, the one we want to focus on is the mother. I think all sentient beings, while we've been in countless different relationships, definitely all of them have at some point been my mother, probably countless times. Just feel it might be possible. All sentient beings have been my mother. And when they were my mother, they did the actions of a mother, those stereotypical things of caring for me, protecting me when I was vulnerable, feeding and clothing me, nurturing me, being my first teacher of so many things, talking and walking, colors and shapes, 
how to navigate in the world. And so whether your own mother of this life is a good example or not, just think of those archetypal mothers or those stereotypical qualities of the best love that samsara has to offer. Every sentient being has been that kind to me. The ones I don't relate to now, the ones I love deeply, the ones I dislike, all of them have cared for me have looked after me as their beloved child. And so as you think of the kindness of all our kind mothers, see if you can let it move into a sense of gratitude and wishing to repay. Not out of obligation, not from some place of pressure, but from deep, deep appreciation. May I repay this kindness all the sacrifices my mothers have made for me, all of the things they've shown me, all of the protections and cares. May I repay this kindness. How do I repay this kindness? Well, they want happiness. So may they have happiness. May all my mothers have happiness. Connect with that mind of love. May they have happiness. And they're not always happy. They're so often struggling, my kind mothers. What they don't want is suffering and pain. May they be free of suffering and pain. Let your mind move into compassion. May they be free of suffering. May they be free of suffering. But am I repaying their kindness by simply wishing them happiness and freedom from suffering? Or do I need to take some responsibility? May I facilitate 
than being free from their suffering. May I actually be involved, an actual participant in alleviating the suffering of sentient beings. Let that compassion move into great compassion, the highest intention. I will free them from suffering. And in that beautiful commitment, wanting to take responsibility, comes the question, how? How? Sometimes I'm useful, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I mean to help, but wind up harming. How do I actually alleviate suffering of sentient beings? and land on bodhicitta, the way to actually benefit sentient beings is to myself be free of suffering and to have developed all the qualities to their utmost extent. So may I become a Buddha, may I become fully enlightened, and in this way I will be the most powerful condition to help facilitate the transformation of others. I will become a Buddha for their sake. Okay, and relax your attention. And so this one, this gratitude catalyst one, this is really incredibly powerful if you work your way through it, really touching something. But the tricky thing is the idea of having a feeling of gratitude that doesn't feel like obligation. Because gratitude with obligation is a recipe for resentment. Yeah. So what you're wanting is to feel that like heart filled with gratitude feeling. So it's just deep, deep appreciation. And it's not feeling, oh, I didn't deserve it. Or, oh, I should be a good person and repay it. It's not with all those you know, miscellaneous baggage that come together with gratitude often. It's just feeling so filled with appreciation. And, you know, really think about any kindness that you've experienced in your life where you were deeply touched. And then I think some version of this, every single sentient being has given to me. You know, maybe it's easier with strangers for some of us because it's too loaded with family. You know, think about when you, you know, blew a tire out and someone helped you change a tire on the side of the road and they didn't have to and they just did because they were being a nice person and it really helped to have another set pair of hands and you just are like, oh, thank you. Oh, you know, like it really genuinely made life better. Thank you so much. And then you really want to pay it forward. Not because you have to, not because anyone's watching. You're just so happy to have been helped. You want to keep helping. You know, that kind of gratitude. So you really, then you're being very honest about, you can help now, but it's pretty limited, you know, and it's a little clumsy and it's a little drowning person helping drowning person. So really, if we want to be effective, efficiently, we need to deal with our own stuff. 
So we're not dealing with our own stuff out of self-cherishing. We're dealing with our own, own stuff for the sake of all beings and thinking, I need to get out of suffering and habits of harm. I need to develop my qualities all the way. And that doesn't mean I can't help people along the way. It doesn't mean I have to like stop helping people until I'm a Buddha, right? But it means that the attitude I bring to the care of others actually has less pressure on it. You're like, I will absolutely do all I can in this moment for these people in my life. But that is not the whole of my vision. My vision is becoming a Buddha for the welfare of all sentient beings. And so, yes, absolutely, anyone across my path, I'm going to do the best I can for them. But if it works, great. If it doesn't work, that wasn't the main point. The main point was the attitudes I'm developing and enriching and developing depth with that. Does that make sense? And then your radius of impact naturally increases and your ability to benefit people naturally increases, but you don't get stretched thin. It's a, it's a naturally growing capacity, you know, rather than just trying to dash everywhere and help every charity and help every neighbor and help every family member when that kind of help is just symptoms relief. You're not getting to the core of the issues. And, you know, feel, feel some of those moments in your life when you've been deeply benefited, maybe in a spiritual way or in some deeply transformative way. Sometimes it's just one conversation, you know, and to be the sort of person that's a catalyst for someone else's transformation. This is what we want to start becoming like the other person still has to participate. We can't force anyone out of suffering, you know, as much as we'd like to. We can't force anyone out of suffering, but we can be a very powerful condition to meet their wisdom. So as we grow as a condition, we actually become more efficient and we can help more people more deeply, more quickly. Does that make sense? So, so developing this big picture, this deep attitude, gradually your, your actual benefit has more lasting impact. So this is kind of ways to think. So whether it's uh, equalizing and exchanging or it's sevenfold cause and effect, either of those strategies are really good ones. And then having kind of the, the, the backup and the continuous thread of the Bodhisattva vows. That's kind of what we're talking about if we want to be very logistical and strategic about genuinely making our Bodhicitta stick rather than a thought that comes and goes or something kind of incidental and wispy to make it stick and firm. We need a lot of reflection and it very much helps to have the vows. Okay, so going on with the text, um, there's also antidotes and the antidotes of course are antidotes to self-cherishing and self-grasping. And we know this from last time. I think we understand self-cherishing generally is this obliviousness to the welfare of others. Self-grasping refers to the um, innate ignorance that we all have. And these two thoughts are the primary focus of combat in these mind training texts or lojong practice. So having made mistakes under the influence of self-cherishing and self-grasping, then we purify, right? We need to purify so that those don't ripen as suffering in future. And that's where we get into chapter two, the confession of negativities. And it's interesting that the confession of negativities chapter doesn't start with confession of negativities. <laughs> it starts with offerings, yeah, and there's all these beautiful poetic verses about I offer this and I offer that and I offer this and I offer that. And they're beautiful, but why? And it's because they're for developing a habit of generosity and closeness and creation of merit. So it's it's an interesting kind of uh, psychology to look at. So if we're doing, um, let's see, beginning of confession verse, confessing negativities. Like whatever flowers and fruit there are, whatever kinds of medicine, whatever jewels exist, whatever clean, refreshing waters, jewel mountains, forest groves, you know, it's like, it's getting crazy, right? Fragrances, incense of the realms of gods, wish-fulfilling trees, jeweled trees, uncultivated harvests, like it's just going to town with the offerings, this whole section. And you're thinking, well, some of these things, I don't even own these things. How can I give them? I don't even own them. 
And how do I give them? Who do I give them to? What, what? I mean, it's pretty, but what? And you're remembering that what you're offering to is the field of merit or the field of accumulation, all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that already exist, none of whom need any offerings, right? They're not bereft of offerings. They don't need anything. And they will help you even if you gave them nothing. You're not trying to like buy their care. They are a support for you to develop merit. And so by imagining things that you yourself find beautiful, this is what the poetry of it's trying to convey. So some of the verses hit the nail on the head and some of them don't. Some of them you're like, I don't really get that one, but oh, that's beautiful. What you're trying to think is, all right, where have I been that is lovely? You know, you could think of the beautiful garden at Land of Joy, you know, with its nice brick and the beautiful green houses and the amazing flowers in there. And think of the way the, the temperature subtly shifts when you close the bugger gate, which is a really annoying gate, but it's great it, once you're in, right? <laughs> and you can think of the soft green grass and just think of how beautiful it is there. And you don't own it, but you own your awareness of it, right? You own your experience of it. And very easy is to develop then attachment to it. But instead of doing that, you think this beautiful experience, this soft green grass, these beautiful flowers, this wonderful temperature free from wind, all of this beauty I offer to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Yes, you're immediate, you're valuing, you're treasuring, you're offering up rather than valuing, treasuring and hoarding. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And in this opening up process, it's developing a habit of generosity. So the habit of generosity means it'll kick in whenever need is relevant. Yeah. And developing a habit of generosity, generosity in Buddhism is the intention to give. It's not the materials of giving. But when you give something to someone, doesn't it imply a closeness? It implies some kind of connection. And so by making offerings to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, you're coming closer to them. They've been right there the whole time, but feeling connection to them can be hard for us. And so, you know, you're stabilizing a sense of these are all beings who were just like me, just as messy, just as crazy. Yeah, all of the things, maybe worse, maybe better, whatever. They were sentient beings and now they are Buddhas but they're not like something unrelatable. They get where I've come from. They get where I am, you know? And so you're not feeling like they're these like angelic pie in the sky, sort of crazy, mystical, magical things. You can make them mystical, magical, but also make them real because they are. Yeah. And then make them beautiful offerings. So you're feeling that kind of closeness, you're developing merit and you're creating a habit of generosity. And so you're getting the mind really kind of happy and smooth and just kind of prepared for more spiritual work. And then you shift to making prostrations, which is, of course, for subduing pride and generating respect. But it's the type of respect that supports receptivity and also honors our own Buddha nature. So you're, you become receptive to what you respect. So having words of respect, having gestures of respect, keys your mind into an openness that says this is sacred and important. And by recognizing that there are those who have developed more than you, your pride can quiet down into a, just a quiet humility that has confidence that honors your own Buddha nature. So you're not subjugating yourself, you're subjugating pride. And pride is a tremendous obstacle on the spiritual path. So you make offerings and then you do prostrations. And all of this is part of the seven limb practice that some of you know of. And then we get into confession. So verses 28 through 65 are very explicitly confession verses for developing, um, purifying negative actions through the four opponent powers. The verses are explicitly um, talking about refuge and regret, but implicitly is also remedy and resolve. So the four opponent powers are refuge, regret, remedy, and resolve. And you're developing a sense of reliance, of safety, of like safe harbor, safe direction to suitable inner and outer objects. 
And so we're remembering just our basic teachings on refuge, that a reliable source of refuge is unbiased and impartial, that it helps regardless of the person being good or bad, right? There's an impartial, unbiased characteristic. And that also they're reliable source of refuge because they themselves have freed themselves from fear and are skilled in freeing others from fear, the fear that comes from the instability related to afflictions and suffering. So whether you call that Buddhism bodhisattvas or not is not really relevant, actually, because Buddhism bodhisattvas might manifest in a million different ways. What you're looking for is this a suitable refuge object. Is this a reliable doctor I would hear a prescription from in a spiritual sense? But then the real refuge, of course, is the Dharma, right? The real refuge is the Dharma. The real refuge is the medicine, but not the pill in your hand, but what you actually take. And so what really protects you from suffering and from negative states of mind is the Dharma that you have integrated. You protect yourself from suffering. So there was outside Dharma you had to meet through an outside person, what you actually heard, but the wisdom is your own. The health is your own, but it was relational. You know, you needed a doctor, you needed a medicine, you needed a teacher, right? You needed the Dharma. But really, like, now you have ownership of it. That's the refuge, is your own development. And so then the Sangha are like your helpers, your community, your support. What does that mean? It means what we're doing right now, which is come together to have these conversations, is a lot easier and deeper and richer than all by yourself. And also being around people that some of whom you can be the helper and some of them you are asking help from creates that beautiful community dynamic that we all are very much benefited from where we're sometimes the student and sometimes the teacher. Yeah, and I really, you know, it's a beautiful community where you feel like you've got something to offer, you've got skills to contribute, you've got energy to add. And also when you feel, I want to learn something, I want to develop something. This is really a beautiful thing about community. And it's so enriching. And of course, the real Sangha are people who have realized emptiness directly because they've cut all the problems and they're no longer on the symptoms relief path. They're on the deep rooted causes of suffering path, getting rid of those. But the relative Sangha is huge. And, you know, and people holding vows, monks and nuns, whether they're ordinary people or not ordinary people, they're, they're supposed to be reminders of the determination to be free from samsara, right? So we're reminders to each other, we're reminders to ourselves, hopefully we're reminders to you, whether or not we have our act together or not is kind of incidental, hopefully we try, right? But the idea is that you see a renunciate, you're reminded, may I renounce suffering and the causes of suffering. Yeah, you see the robes, you see the shaved head, you think, may I, may I give up suffering and the causes of suffering? Yeah, like that. So when you're connecting to refuge, there's all sorts of beautiful verses. And then you're connecting with regret, which is one of the biggest pieces for purification, which is seeing a fault to be a fault. And again, it only works if it's personal. So you're thinking today, body, speech, mind, what have I been up to? And you go through that, and then you apply a remedy, and then you make a promise that's practical and sustainable. So um, these guys like this. Um, looks like we don't have time today to do it, but I think you all know that you all know the drill. And what I'd suggest is that you visualize Vajrasattva above the crown of your head, read verses 26 and 27, and then genuine the power of regret, fueled by verses 28 through 40. So those are like, this is your homework, should you choose to accept it? Yeah, try using confession using the verses. And then once you've read the, those verses, think from Vajrasattva's heart down through the crown of your head comes purifying white nectar as you recite the mantra, Om Vajrasattva Hum. And do that, you know, 28 times and then develop a resolution, practical, time-specific promise to refrain from harmful actions in the future, right? Physically, verbally, and mentally. So these confession verses, um, some of them are 
a little bit triggering, uh, the regret verses, but I, I encourage you to read them. They're, they're interesting. And if you sit with them, it might give you a real shift in the way to approach regret. Yeah. And it really speaks to impermanence and death as well. So it's like, don't delay regretting, right? Death is coming like that. Yeah. So are there any um, last questions before we call it a day? And um, yeah, and I can share the PowerPoint for you guys as well. I'll send it to the Land of Joy team and they can disseminate it as they see fit. Um, so hopefully we'll get to some more verses next time. But I think my feeling is to go into the patience chapter and the wisdom chapter a lot. But does anyone have any, um, I guess, requests, bits that you've really wanted to go back to or go more into? I can flag it for next time. not <laughs> okay lots of patience uh lots of wisdom and uh bits and pieces throughout but please if if you feel up to it have a read of those verses in the confession um section it's really interesting and uh can be really beautiful practice so we'll go ahead and dedicate John to some chorim boshe, ma ke panam ke gyurchi, ke pan yam pa me pa yang, gon he gon du pelwa sho, don he dawa rim boshe, ma ke panam ke gyurchi, ke pan yam pa me pa yang, gon he gon du pelwa sho. May all of our teachers show the aspect of long life and good health, and may we meet them continuously until samsara ends. Thank you so much, everyone. Amazing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yes.